invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the, to the book of uh, Romans, <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. And as you're turning there, just uh, a few more announcements as, as we uh, continue to grow from under God's blessing. I just feel like there's more and more things that we need to kind of keep in front of you. But um, as you can see on this side, almost all the way to the front, we have um, recovered our gray panels. We're getting ready for the new rug to be put down. And uh, we still have this side and a, a couple more on this side. So if you um, covering those, it doesn't take a whole lot of um, would we say ingenuity? Is that the right word? To, to do that, um, we, we could certainly use your help. And Scott Van Giesen up here in the front, Lisa's husband, is the one to see if you can help us during the week to kind of finish that project. Also, um, we uh, have a baptistry. And uh, when you come to know Jesus, the Bible uh, calls us to be baptized as a public symbol of of your commitment to him. And we have a baptistry, but it's buried way back here under all this stuff. And so um, at my last church, it was kind of the same situation. And we purchased a portable baptistry like this that you can set up in about an hour, fill it with water. It's got a heater. Uh, it's, it's just a much easier way to do a, to do a Baptist, uh, Baptist service. Excuse me. And we would just set it up here, here in the front. Right now, we've got about 11 people that are, that are ready to be baptized. But um, this whole mechanism here costs about $3,000. And uh, we almost have enough in the, our reserve funds to purchase that. But if you would like to give towards that, this is something we hope we have to use more and more because we want to see people coming into the kingdom. So uh, if, if you would like to give today or next week, we're just... We're going to try to go ahead and order that because, again, we've got a number of people waiting to be baptized. But I wanted to put to you. Then, uh, in front of you, um, in the pocket, there's this little white envelope, and on it, it says Care Fund. And I just wanted to make mention this morning that, um, essentially, this, this is an opportunity for us to give um, above and beyond our regular offering to help those in need. Uh, most, mostly from our own church family. We're entering into a time now where it's going to get cold, and sometimes some families have trouble with their heating costs or food or Christmas. I just wanted to let you know that that's what this is all about. Um, we have a woman that we've been reaching out to and helping. She's got five kids, got cancer. Um, this would kind of be the fund that we would use also to, to come alongside of her and help her. But I did want to make you aware of this. This is uh, a fund that our deacons oversee. And so when somebody has a need, they, they meet with the deacons and, you know, just kind of say, hey, this is where I'm at. I, I could use some help. And um, that's the fund that we use for those kinds of situations. So I just wanted to make you aware of a few more of those uh, things that are before us. Now, I promise we're going to get out of chapter one. Someday, not quite sure yet when, but we're, we're, we're marching forward. We're marching forward. But today we find ourselves here uh, in the first chapter, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 15. But before we do that, let's turn to the Lord, allowing his spirit to just minister through his word. God, we thank you that it's your truth that we rest our lives on. We thank you that, that you have given to us this holy word. These words that have been breathed from your own very mouth and given to us out of your love. And Father, we recognize that it's really only your Holy Spirit that work through the truth of your word. And, and so we're asking again that you would just fall upon us even now that you would give us clarity of mind and understanding and wisdom. That God, you would draw us to yourself. That we would fall in love with you, fresh and anew this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So beginning at verse 8 of chapter 1, here in the book of Romans, Paul says, First, thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by, by God's will I may now at last succeed in, in coming to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often in, intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. For I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. As we've seen in our study, um, Paul has had this dramatic and dramatic and powerful uh, transformation in his life, this change so big, so powerful, so revolutionary, so distinct, so uh, convic convicting and, and convincing that he has now literally, as we saw in verse 1, sold himself over to this Jesus, allowing him to have authority, allowing him to have influence and, and leadership and power and dominance over his life. Because you see, Paul has realized that living life his way, living life for himself, that track, that, that pathway has has left him empty and void and feeling worthless. God reached down by nothing but pure grace and transformed this man. Transformed him from purposelessness to, to purpose. From powerlessness to power. From meaninglessness to meaning from joylessness to joy, from unshakable peace, from emptiness to, to fullness. And Paul knows that this grace is, is available to all men. And so he writes this letter that sits before us. He writes this letter with zeal and passion and, and eagerness and, and longing. Because he, because he knows full well that life without Jesus is really not life at all. Transformation, this life change, this turnaround pro produces a, a, a life that is full, a life that is satisfying, a life that now has purpose and meaning and direction and joy and peace, and truth, and, and wisdom, and encouragement. But as we've seen, this love, this grace, is not forced upon any one of us. Because that wouldn't be love. Jesus gives us the choice to change. The truth for transformation. The encouragement for this Great exchange. But it requires just one thing, and as we've seen over and over, it's, it's simple faith. It's simple trust. It's simple confidence. Believing that Jesus is who He says He is, and that Jesus can do what He says He can do. It's putting our trust in his finished work on the cross and not trust in our own selves. Paul tells us in another letter 
that he's written, the, the letter to the church at Ephesus, that, that God can, can save you from by his grace when you believe. And he says that, that we can't take any credit for this exchange, this transformation that happens, because it is a gift from him. He says salvation is, is not a reward for the good things that we've done so that none of us can boast about it. It's like I said a couple of weeks ago, it starts with Jesus, and it's sustained by Jesus, and it all ends with Jesus. Change. Transformation. Life alteration. Restoration. Renewal. Rebirth. Rejuvenation. It's what our hearts long for, isn't it? It's what we all want to experience. We all want a part of that. I mean, don't we all get tired of pursuing things that just seem to rust and fade and, and die away? Don't we get tired of just trying to kind of keep up with the current trends of the world? Don't we just get tired of trying to live with, with kind of like one foot in the world and one foot in God's truth? It gets old. It gets tiring. But Paul says to us, I also was in that state. And he said, I wanted this, this connection with God. And it's so bad, he says, that, that essentially I became a, a religious revolutionary, a religious extremist, and yet it still left me empty until I found a personal relationship with Jesus. And he says, when I found Jesus, my, my life, my time, my treasures, my energy, my, my very existence all became his. And he says to us here in verse, I now live for his name's sake. You see, Paul began to wake up every morning with this God-given reason to live. Reason to be joyful. Reason to be at peace. Reason to now sacrifice for others. Reason to, to love others. Reason to spend his whole life living in the gospel and for the gospel. The verses that we've read this morning from this first chapter, we begin to get a glimpse, we begin to get a glance into a, a number of things that, that changed in Paul's life when Jesus transformed him. And these are five things that are supernaturally changed in our own lives, in our own souls, in our own being, when we too are changed by the supernatural love of Jesus. Five passions over time begin to, 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 to give us real life, to give us real substance, to give us real fervor for the day ahead. We see here in our text first that when we are transformed by Jesus, we'll begin to have a, a passionate, godly love for others. Paul says in verse 8, I, I thank my God through Jesus Christ, he says, for all of you. Now understand that here is a group of people that he's writing to far away in Rome. These are, this, is, this is a group of people that, that Paul has never met. He's never interacted with. He's never sat down and had a cup of coffee with. And yet, Paul says that he's thankful for their brotherhood. He's thankful for their companionship. He's, he's thankful for their union. He's thankful for their friendship in the gospel. 
So he's interested in their lives and he's captivated by their faith. And knowing really nothing personally about them other than their union with Jesus, Paul actually takes the time to, to sit down and, and write this letter that we have before us. And he does so because God has planted in his heart a passionate, godly love for others. Now, what does that mean for us? When God gets a hold of our lives, he's going to change over time our passions, and, and he's going to change us from the inside out in the most vivid change that, that we'll begin to experience as this new focus, this new motivation that isn't just on what I can get for myself or what I can achieve or for what I can have or what I can become. But rather this new transformation as it takes place, my shift begins to focus not on me and mine and what's in it for me, but now it's on others and what I can give away and how I can love others and how I can put others above myself. Understand, it doesn't come natural. It's supernatural. John 13, 35, Jesus says, your love for one another, your love will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So here's the question. Am I experiencing the life-changing love of Jesus? And seeing His love flow in me and then out of me, am I willing to accept that love? Some of us have a hard time just ever believing that the God of the universe could love me because I'm so messed up and I'm so screwed up and I've done so many crazy and dumb things and, and my sin is so great. And, 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 and yet his love, the word tells us, is even greater. But am I willing to believe that? That's the question. When Paul, I mean, when Jesus begins to transform us by his love. Again, supernatural things start to flow out of us. And in 1 Corinthians 13, we have this description of what God's love really looks like, especially when it flows out of me. And he says there in, in that chapter, he says, love, it's patient, it's kind, it's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of wrong. It, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And then he kind of wraps it all up by saying this, three things will last forever, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Secondly, we're transformed by Jesus. When we're transformed by Jesus, we will passionately begin to pray for others. Paul, again here in our text in verse 9, says, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. You see, again, Paul knew that in and of himself, he couldn't do anything of any spiritual value in helping others or loving others or caring for others or serving others, because if he relied on his own strength or his own power, he'd fail. And so here he tells us that when Jesus of his life, not only did he have this renewed, passionate love for others, but he also had this new heart that, that longed to bring others before the throne of God through the vehicle of prayer. How many of us get involved in 
some kind of service to the Lord. Some ministry. And prayer becomes kind of just this add-on to what we're doing is important. Maybe we have this great Sunday school lesson that we put together, but it brings no change to our students. Maybe we put on this incredible first class, awesome outreach event, but nobody really comes to know Jesus personally. Maybe we have this um, really hip church, and, and we've got the smoke going and the lights, and hundreds of people are coming in, but it all becomes entertainment driven. Really, nothing spiritually really happens in our hearts because God was never sought out. Because not God was never called upon. Because God was never even considered. It sounds foreign, but I've seen it happen over and over again. And you see, when it comes to changed lives, it's not by human means that the heart is warmed to the things of God. It's not that those things are wrong in and of themselves. It's, it's great to decorate. It's great to have um, you know, up-to-date kinds of stuff. It's great to put a new carpet down and, and paint the walls, but that's not going to change the heart of man. When it comes to changed lives, it's all about God. And it's all about His grace. And so let's not waste our time as a church with all kinds of stylish, trendy, faddish, hip things if we're not going to spend time on our knees asking that God's Spirit shows up. See, the power of God will never show up until prayer becomes our primary duty. And as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's how important prayer is to Christ's followers. Thirdly, when we're transformed by Jesus, we're going to see strength in you. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, speaking to followers of Jesus, Paul writes out these words to the church at Corinth. And he says at the beginning of it all, he says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. When we enter into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus, the Bible tells us that, that God imparts to each one of us a spiritual gift, and that spiritual gift is given to us by, by His power for the building up, for the strengthening of the church family, the church community. And there in 1 Corinthians 12, there's a variety of gifts that are mentioned. I'm not sure. I don't think necessarily that those are all the gifts that are that are necessarily listed there. But the spiritual gift that God gives to you, it could be something like leading or teaching or just serving or giving or helping. But whatever it is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have it. And whatever it is, its ability comes directly from God. And so for Paul, as we've seen, a couple of his spiritual gifts are, are, are teaching, being an apostle, leading. He is passionately now wanting to share those gifts with this church in Rome. And when God pursues us out of his love for us, not only will he give us this newfound love for others, and not only will he give us this longing to pray for others, but God will also give to us this spiritual gift that we'll desire from the bottom of our hearts to impart 
to others, to give away 